This is APR Case Files. Hear this message. Tune this channel. Like E.T. said. Hello and welcome to this fifth edition of API Case Files, the official podcast of the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations Team. Here we discuss some of our more interesting cases, conduct interviews with notable authors, scientists, and subject matter experts, and talk with others involved in unidentified aerial phenomena and the associated interests surrounding the study of that phenomena. I'm Marsha Barnhart, API Chief of Investigations, and with me is Antonio Paris, founder and director of API. Hey folks, this is Antonio Paris. I am glad that you have joined us. We have another interesting and engaging program lined up today. We'll have a roundtable discussion of some of the most recent cases, and we'll hear another installment of Paul Carr's Unidentified Science. Also, Antonio will present his investigator's toolbox. Let's start the show with Marsha's interview with Ted Rowe. He is the executive director of NARCAP, the National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomena. NARCAP scientists and aviation experts bring a systematic, scientific approach to the study of aerial phenomena. We were honored to have Ted Rowe as our guest, and we think you'll join the conversation he had with Marsha about their organization. Ted Rowe, I appreciate you lending us some of your time. Uh, You're the executive director of NARCAP, which stands for the National Aviation Reporting Center on Anomalous Phenomenon. And uh, you, I think, NARCAP's been in existence for about 15 years, since 1999, and and you started it along with uh, Dr. Haynes, did you? That's correct. I met Dr. Haynes. We became friends through an investigation. He came to me with this idea he had for a a reporting center project. It looked like a good idea and it seemed relevant, so I took on the administrative side of it and together we got it in the air and uh, brought it up to about 55 people on board, which we've had that status for most of the duration of our organization. You have 55 people? Yeah, um, well, 55 supporting researchers, um, international technical specialists, uh, American technical specialists, and then research associates. And then we have a whole cadre of people behind them that are that are just supportive. So you kind of have area experts that you call on that are kind of a loose association? That, that's correct. We're a virtual organization. We're spread out around the world. And uh, as we have cases develop here in the States, we call upon the expertise of the, the specialists we need to help us uh, engage the investigation. I see. Okay. Well, I was going to ask about a general overview of your operation. The way it works is I I run the administrative side of the organization. Dr. Haynes is our science chief. He leads all investigations and handles all scientific publications, Um, uh, is the final arbiter as far as any papers that are submitted. Um, And then we work together. We have a group of executive advisors. There's five of them, including Dr. Billy and Mr. Brian Smith and, and a few others. Um, and then we take on cases. We, we go to our uh, executive advisory committee if we have policy issues. And then um, as far as uh, investigations go, we look at the case itself. We see what's required. And then the people whose specialties are involved with those requirements get pulled in to be the part of the core investigation. What's an anatomy of your typical investigation? How do you normally approach that? Well, generally, it, it starts with a, a pilot report. Um, and the issue is whether it's current or historical. If it's a current report, within a couple of weeks, uh, we make an attempt through the Freedom of Information Act to acquire uh, audio tapes and hard copy encrypted radar data, and then we'll attempt to recreate the event by reviewing those tapes and looking at the the radar plots once we recreate them, and that'll that'll help part of our investigation. If it's a historical case, then then we go at it a little bit differently, um, and whenever possible, we try to get a direct interview with the experiencer themselves, and it's very in-depth. Um, we have a pretty complex reporting form as well. So um, between the two, we, we uh, 
We try to glean as much information as we can. Uh, Dr. Haynes is a perceptual psychologist, and his specialty was space, uh, human factors, and aeronautics and astronautics, human factors. He's the uh, chief of the Space Human Factors Office at Ames Research Center. Um, and is, he's an expert in visual acuity and in uh, perceptual issues. So uh, we bring his skill set to bear, uh, both looking at the witness and also looking at the environment the witness was operating in. And then uh, uh, once we get to a point where we've got a document and we're, we're uh, looking at publishing it, then we give it a good team review and make sure that we're, we've got all the I's dotted and T's crossed, and then we go ahead and publish it. Um, we try not to let anything out that's confidential. Uh, we don't use reporters' names unless they allow us specifically to do that, and we ask them specifically, and usually they don't, and we're very careful with them and their contribution. When you publish, you release it to your website, or do you uh, go to scientific journals or something of that nature? Well, it kind of depends on the type of case and whether it fits in, in the current scientific journals. If there's a place for it, we might give it a try. But, but, but we always publish to our website, and any case that we undertake that comes to a conclusion, we, 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 we try to make that transparent and visible to everybody's website. Um, we've run our cap basically out of our own pockets for 15 years. We haven't been a nonprofit organization or a business at all. And we've done it that way to maintain control of our program. And now things are shifting. We, we're getting a lot more active on the international field and we need to uh, develop funding sources and that sort of thing. So that we're, we're moving into a, a business model that, that will support our research this year. It's a marketing plan, basically, and, and uh, outreach. Um, our focus is on the aviation community. Uh, we we don't really preach to the, the, the choir as far as uh, ufology goes, but um, we, we'll go ahead. Our 501c3 process is, is uh, wrapping up here sometime, I'm told, by the IRS sometime in the next month or two. Uh-huh. Some of our correspondents prior to our interview, you had mentioned uh, Robert Bigelow was interested in buying access to photos and things of that nature. I mean, as far as Mr. Bigelow is concerned, uh, um, he, he wanted to buy Dick's files outright and would have allowed us to make copies of anything he want, we wanted, but he wanted the files. And uh, once he has them, of course, nobody ever sees them again. So we, we vetoed that um, as a team. But uh, the idea of having people running the show, I, I think after 15 years of doing NARCAP the way we're doing it, I, uh, our, our reputation stands on its own, and anybody that invests in what we do and allows us to continue doing what we're doing is only going to see a positive return for their time. You will stay independent. Oh yeah, we're, we're beholden to nobody, and uh, uh, if, if people invest in us, they can they can bet that they're they're investing in exactly what they think they are, which is good, solid research with a strong reputation. Bye. That's good to hear. Now, as far as I understand, NARCAP's objective is that you direct research, gauge information on a wide range of atmospheric effects and things of that nature. But your your main interest is that you try to find things that might threaten flight safety. That's correct. In fact, those are really the only cases we engage are cases that have some apparent effect of involving aviation safety factors. We, we do take uh, pilot reports of observations. We're very interested in anything a pilot has to tell us about unidentified aerial phenomena. But the primary motivators for an investigation on our part involve safety factors like loss of separation, near mid-air collisions, um, uh, crew factors, distraction, this sort of thing. Um, transient or permanent equipment failures that, that happen concurrent to UAP events. That would seem work closely aligned with the FAA safety reporting system. Well, actually, we, we met with the Aviation Safety Reporting System and their director. Um, uh, Mr. Brian Smith at the time was, uh, I think he was the chief of the Aviation Safety Office at Ames Research Center, and uh, he arranged for us to meet with the uh, um, analysts and their director for the Aviation Safety Reporting System, which is a confidential reporting system, by the way. It's a way that the FAA can gather data and not lose it because pilots are afraid of being penalized if there's an actual FAA investigation. So the ASRS is a confidential database where pilots can report near mid errors or problems with air control, this kind of thing. But the difference between you and the FAA is that the FAA doesn't really want to hear about UAP, right? That's that's pretty much the truth of it. The r- reports do get in. They come in under code words like unidentified traffic or this sort of thing uh, with a very vague generality as far as a description goes. Um, people will try and report them that way. Um, the FAA instructs pilots in its AIM manual to uh, 
report anything involving a UFO to a civilian UFO reporting center. So the, um, there, there's, there's an institutional problem as far as getting data. They don't want to know. If, if a pilot can't tell them what it was that they saw, then they don't want to know about it. And I, I'm not sure why that is. I think it's uh, institutional uh, leftover from uh, Gen F-146 or other historical factors. The main thing is, is that, that a lot of pilots come to us when they retired, uh, within months of retiring. Uh, and we're not the only ones that get pilot reports. I was talking to Jan Harzan over at MUFON here the other day, and he was telling me the same thing, that he gets these pilot reports that show up just a couple of months after the pilot retires. Um, and it's all uh, a bias. I wrote a paper on it. It's it's um, a, a fear of um, having their job or their uh, professional life impacted by making a statement there. And in some cases, the, that fear is justified. In others, it isn't. Some, some cultures and some airlines uh, don't really have a problem with it. With, with pilots trying to deal with these things and will support them even uh, to an extent. Uh, and others won't even talk about it. They won't even allow a conversation. So that, that tells me that there's no dark strings behind everything telling everybody to shut up. It, it's just more of an institutional interpretation of the past around that subject. The institutions seem to be officially uninterested in that, but it seems sometimes when people put in FOIA reports, it would appear that those institutions unofficially are quite interested in the phenomenon. Well, I I think that's just consistent with people in general. I I think Gallup did a poll back in 2003 or something and found that 78% of the American public thought that UFOs existed and, and were probably extraterrestrial incursions and that the government knew about it and wasn't telling anybody. So, uh, I think that's kind of consistent. We get a lot of dot .gov inquiries into our, our website, um, and I, I don't think that that's necessarily coming out of anybody's, you know, official office or anything. Uh, there's a there's a constant unofficial interest in this this topic. It's it's one of those things where people really do their imaginations are engaged if they haven't seen UAP, and if they have, then they're they tend to be traumatized or scarred by it. So it, it makes an impact in society, and that impact shows in the interest, of, I think, coming out of government. Fr- frankly, I, I think a lot of, if there is, was UFO information inside of government, and I, there, there clearly was, if you look at Richard Dolan's histories and others, I, I think it's migrated out of government. It's probably in, if there's anything to it, it's, it's in private industry, and we're not going to get it by knocking on doors or demanding information. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I, I suspect that's true. They they shoved it over into the privatized military industrial complex that is going to keep that as proprietary information, and FOIA isn't going to be able to touch them. That's right. So that was you know, his... and that, that's if there's something to it. Now that these are all, this is all talking about things that are more speculative. This isn't really where NARCAP is going. Uh, we exist specifically because we we don't have any kind of a confrontational relationship with the government. We aren't demanding that they tell us what they know. Uh, they they gave up studying these things in 1968, according to the official party line, and and they were wrong in their conclusions. And their conclusions were misrepresented. If you look at Special Report Report 14. Um, so they're not really the experts on the field. And then you have to defer to the experts. Who are the experts? It's the people that are doing, doing the work, the scientifically acceptable engagement of the topic. And that involves the, some of the official government organizations of the world and a few efforts to merit, uh, that, um, like yours and, um, and others, that are attempting to bring some objectivity and, and good, good observation skills to the, to the subject. Our investigations will often, most often, be with witnesses who are certainly not experts. But you almost exclusively deal with what one would think uh, would be kind of an expert on judging aerial phenomena. They're pilots and ground crew and, and radar experts and such, correct? That is correct. Um, the, 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 the caution here is that there's still people, they still operate from perceptual um, shortcomings that we all have. And, and in some cases with pilots, they know it. You know, they, they said, well, I can't really tell you how far away it was. Distance is hard to judge. It was against the blue sky, you know, this sort of thing. Um, so they, they acknowledge that they have weaknesses. Um, and and on, the, on the flip side, there are um, illusions and delusions that occur in flight that can be tracked down. Um, this is part of Dr. Haynes' work as a perceptual psychologist, so that we can actually try and determine whether there was an internal response to, to something that was misinterpreted or whether there was actually something there that was truly out of, out of line. 
So, um, so it is kind of a misnomer for us to assume that because somebody is uh, attached to some aeronautical profession, let's say, that does not necessarily make them a better witness? Well, it's true. It's true. Um, and oftentimes, as I, I'm sure you've encountered in your investigations, um, perceptions are colored by beliefs. So, so you'll get an interpretation of what they saw based on what they believe. And words like craft will crop up, or words like angels will crop up. You know, other types of words will crop up in an attempt for them to describe what, what it was they encountered. And, and you, you don't want to second-guess them, but in a way, you kind of have to. And, uh, and, and, and air, air professionals are really no different. Um, the one, bit, one good thing about this, for the most part, they're college-educated. And most of them are hard sciences. Um, anybody that flies from the military and then matriculates out into a a professional career in a commercial airline has a, a hard science degree. So they have good critical skills, usually, and good judgment, usually. And when they, when they tell you that, that they've encountered something that they, they really can't uh, set to right in their own worldview, then it, it's worth taking a look and trying to understand it. Um, one, one of the key things in this, Marsh, is that, that this isn't the first phenomenon that pilots have run into uh, that, that nobody believed them on and that turned out to be something real. Um, pilots for years, um, for decades, reported upward lightning, uh, leaving the tops of clouds going into the upper atmosphere. And physicists were just not impressed. Atmospheric physicists of the time said, just no way, it's not happening. Except for a couple who continued collecting these pilot anecdotes of what they were seeing. And they got enough of these together to where they had sort of a, a platform to make a hypothesis and attempt some observations. And in 1989, they proved that blue jets and sprites and red dwarves and these, these strange electrical phenomena were real and that pilots had been correct all along in terms of telling people what they'd been seeing. It, it, it seems to me that, that, that you know, they do have uh, credibility on their side as far as new phenomena go. Now, um, that, that is interesting. I was going to ask you what types of phenomena have pilots or, or others been reporting that ended up becoming some new information, uh, a contribution to science, and one of them is the earth lights or sp- sprites or whatever, and are there others? Well, um, you know, there are, there are other types of phenomena that we've learned more about through the aviation field. You know, lightning, for example. Uh, the aviation community has spent a great deal of money and time trying to understand lightning and trying to lightning-proof their aircraft. And there are all kinds of lightning, and there's other types of luminous atmospheric phenomena that, um, that involve ionization on the wingtips and this sort of thing that all of them needed to be understood and engaged. Um, ball lightning was one of them. Uh, and, and this constant report of uh, spherical uh, balls of light, um, it's just, uh, it, it's constant in the data. I did a, a study of 120 cases involving aviation safety factors, and 44 of them involved what were apparently spherical lights that had varying effects from uh, concurrent failures on electronic systems to uh, perceptual issues, believing that they're going to be hit by the thing, repeated head-on passes, this kind of stuff. Uh, and it's hard to kind of, to, to break it down, I mean, earth lights, for example, uh, there's a site in uh, the southwestern U.S. that we've been using as a lab, and um, the phenomena that manifest there include orange balls of light, uh, and they seem a lot like the orange balls of light that we get pictures of from time to time and that pilots tell us about and so on, but we see them at ground level. So are these the same balls of light that the pilots are encountering in the air? Um, these are questions that we have to try and resolve, and I don't I'm not really sure how to go about that, but it's part of the path of science to get to the answers. Uh, and we don't know what these things are. They're quite variable, uh, and, and some of them seem a bit provocative uh, when, when you think about the ETH, this sort of thing. So, You've done a study on the spheres that you published. Yes, yes, we did. It's called Project Sphere. Uh, it involved contributions from about 20 NARCAP members. It was a, truly a global effort in terms of bringing it together, but yeah, it was a, an in-depth study of phenomena that present as spherical lights or objects. What did you find? Uh, well, um, of course, we're, we're looking at it from the aviation safety perspective, and what we found was that, that these, these spherical balls of light are primary contributors to aviation safety factors, and that we need to train pilots and air controllers to, to know that these things are out there and to make a habit of putting them behind them whenever they encounter them. Uh, the problem is, is that they could be one of several different phenomena. Uh, there's a, uh, a guy, uh, Jay Vandervander, I think is his name. He's uh, an atmospheric physicist who's studying an idea called extreme ball lightning, which is a natural phenomena. It's not going to get out of the way of your airplane, and it, it carries about a billion joules of potential, which could just 
vaporize an aircraft, and just evaporate it. So pilots need to know that these things might be out there and that they, they, their curiosity shouldn't get the better of them as far as engaging them goes. They aren't, I think they're different things. The different things are presenting as balls of light, so we can't tell them for sure uh, other, other than to just be cautious and stay away. You know, if you see a ball of light, then, you know, put, put it behind you, make all the reports you can make, but, but don't stay there and uh, uh, let it affect your, the, operation, the safe operation of your aircraft. So is that scientist positing that these plasmas or these balls of light are just spontaneously creating themselves just like ball lightning does near water with certain atmospheric conditions? Well, they're... they're they're, they're natural phenomena, so they, there's, pro, there's something causal that brings them about. Um, uh, one of the ideas kicked around was that they're not electrostatic and that they involve uh, uh, quantum particles that, that are not electrons or protons, uh, so that they have characteristics kind of of a solid. They can reflect radar, um, uh, that sort of thing, but are, but are not solid and, uh, and are natural. The site in in, uh, in the, the southwest that I was talking about, there's a, a, a similar site at Pestelen, Norway. Are you familiar with this? Yes, yes, I, I am quite familiar with that. And I read that you feel you have found a site that such phenomena is taking place. You're going to work and study there? Yes, uh, we, we've been aware of it for a decade or more. Um, I met Dr. Strand out there, uh, I think it was 2003, uh, and he said it was like Hestelen on steroids. Uh, and it was very active uh, at, at the time. Uh, very provocative phenomena in some cases, in other cases just unusual what, uh, luminosities, um, clear, clearly following the, uh, uh, the plasma idea. Uh, but not all of them were, and we witnessed some things that weren't consistent with the other phenomena that we had seen there. So it was, um, it's a very provocative site. I'm trying to get a study together uh, with Massimo Teodorani to have him come over. He was the project lead at uh, EMBLA at Hesdalet in 2000, I think it was, and uh, I'm going to invite him over and maybe a couple of uh, researchers and try and do an instrumented study of the site. Uh, I'm putting together actually a crowdfunding project to support that, so I'd invite your listeners to keep an ear out for that. Now, here's the beauty of this um, site. The main conundrum has been that, that a lot of scientists have had concerns with is that the measuring and studying of the phenomena is missing because you can't find it enough. It's just so elusive. So the scientific method is really missing. We can bring instruments to bear on at least a, a certain profile of UAP phenomena. We can actually look at them. Um, we can. Uh, we bring all kinds of stuff out there, cameras of various kinds, uh, uh, electronic sensors of various kinds, lightning strike detectors, uh, you name it, uh, just anything that, that will give you a bandwidth and some kind of on, on the EM scale in terms of activity, you know, where you're noticing, hey, I got a, I got a shift in, uh, uh, on the magnetometer here, and now, they're, now we're looking at a light phenomena, you know, there's uh, this kind of thing. So we, we have yet to really set that up the way we want it to. Mr. Strand has done it for about 30 years at Hestelin, so and his model is, is transparent and available, so we're looking at, at those ideas. I'm sure uh, Dr. Teodorani has some other ideas that he'd like to take on as well. It's really just been a matter of putting together enough funding to make it work. We need to spend about three months on the site collecting data and really formulating some ideas on, on what it is we're looking at. Wow, there is um, a book in the making there. Oh, I think so. The, the site is very interesting. It's just loaded with, with rock art probably eight, 9,000 years old in some cases, just layers and layers of it that are blasted away by the desert patina. And for about six months out of the year, you, you, you just can't be there because it's 125 degrees and, and you, it's just you can't function in the day. And it's 100 degrees by 7 or 8 in the morning. So um, it, it's, a, it's a very challenging environment to function in, but, but the phenomena are, are very, very interesting. And the community is truly affected by, by what's going on out there. So it's a very interesting site. Uh, I could go into more detail, but I think I'd like to just go ahead and get the study done and then share it with everybody. I think that it would be a fascinating. Well, at least experience. let me follow up when you say the community is very affected. What do you what do you mean there? Well, they've all seen things that, that they can't resolve, and in some cases, the things they've seen fit the Heineck strangeness catalog for uh, UFO type experiences that, that you know, fall inside the, the zone of experiences that the paradigm of ufology seems most interested in cases that might that are provocative uh, in terms of the extraterrestrial hypothesis. So this enigma is often 
um, aligned with some type of perception by the, the witness that the things they're looking at are not just strange phenomena, but perhaps imbued with some type of awareness or intelligence. Is, is this something that the people from that area are intuiting? I don't know if they're intuiting or not, but they seem to be reflecting that idea that there's an activity there and it, it involves intelligence. Um, to my mind, it's a little odd. I, there, it's a little canyon, um, uh, you know, just a blasted place. Uh, rock art all around the ridges of it and in kind of odd places. And then uh, right above the canyon, it's about 50 feet up, there's a, there's a cap of bedrock about 12 feet thick of limestone, and then the, there's the top. And then about 40 feet in the air above that, there is a row of red lights that light up. They're equidistant, and, and they, they're in the same place. And uh, you'll be looking at them, and then they'll disappear you look at them, and then they'll come on again. You look at them, and they're gone. And, um, and for all the world, they look like lights on the side of a building. You know, they're, they're, they're very fixed in their location. They're not drifting. They're not morphing back and forth between each other. Uh, we get a lot of mobile light phenomena there of various kinds, but that particular one sticks out in my mind. I, I stood there with five researchers. We all had cameras around our necks. None of us could pick the camera up and take a picture. It was 11 o'clock at night, and we were all walking back in from, from a study and, and just... Nobody could do anything. We just stood there and we looked at it. But, uh, but yeah, there's, there's some provocative things there, and and, uh, and it does have effect on psychology. I don't know if these things are emanating microwave or something that's affecting our central nervous systems, or whether there really is something going on there that that is technical in nature, but but it's not something we're tuned to perceive or that operates in a sort of a perceptual blind spot. I I don't know. And you you um, think this phenomena is common to what some reports are being given to you by commercial aircraft pilots and such? Well, I do. I do. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, our technical report 12, I believe it is, it involves an, uh, a group of astronomers on, on the hills of San Bruno who were watching an airliner at dusk coming over the San Bruno hills in to land at San Jose Airport. And they noticed that behind it there was a little white ball of light following it. And uh, at the time, they had what was considered a pretty expensive camera with pretty high resolution. It was 8 or 9 megapixel. And so they shot a series of pictures. And in this series of pictures, this little ball of light comes from behind, pulls up underneath the tail of the aircraft and stays there for a little while, and then breaks away at an oblique angle away from the aircraft. It doesn't experience any buffeting. There's no dynamic pressure forcing it against the fuselage of the aircraft. It holds its own, and then it moves away from the aircraft. And I don't know how to describe a ball of light in terms of behaving intelligently. I don't really know how to write that paper. You know, our, our material um, has provocative events in it, um, much like the French government team or the Chilean government team or, and, and just about every one of the case files released by every nation on the planet includes uh, profiles of UAP that are, are what we're dealing with here at NARCAP. And, and I'd, I'd say, uh, just I, I haven't actually done the work, but I would guess that about half of the phenomena were, uh, that are reported to us are objects. Uh, they're not reported as lights or, or glowing forms. They're reported as objects, and, and that creates a... Uh, you can't ignore that data, but what do you do with it? Yeah, um, I, I would have to agree that other than craft reportings, we get an awful lot of sightings of what people just call orbs. These little lights that seem to be floating around under some type of intelligent control. I mean, get them out of the Carolinas a lot. North and South Carolina is just lousy with orbs, it would seem. And uh, there's been quite Brown, a few Brownie reports. Mountain. I, I don't know. It's it's often conducted near yeah, military that, that, bases, that, though. There's a, there's a, I'm sorry. There's a site in North Carolina called Brownie Mountain where they, they're commonly reported. Ah, so. ah, okay. Hence the name, Brownie Lights or something. But right. That's yeah. That's really very common. Read about it all the time. And um, man, what are those things? You know, um, Doctor Michio Kaku. I, I I got to spend some time with him some years ago. We presented at a a uh, symposium at George Washington University there, uh, Washington D.C. And um, he presented on interstellar travel, and I presented on unidentified aerial phenomena. There was just six of us there, and. Uh, Dr. Lee was there. Dr. Bernie Heiss was there. Uh, Dr. Richard Henry was there. Uh, Dr. Peter Sturrock was there. And then I think John Callahan, who was uh, Director of Accidents and Investigations for the FAA, was there, and myself. And uh, Dr. Koch, who offered 
uh, that we really don't know what we're up against when we consider an extraterrestrial intelligence and its capabilities, if it's, if it's actually making incursions into our domain, that we really don't have an idea of what its potentials are. And what he did was um, uh, Nikolai Kardashev, a Russian uh, researcher, uh, had suggested that you might be able to calibrate civilizations by the, the amount of energy needed to push certain size radio signals. Um, and he did, did described them as class zero, class one, two, and three civilizations. And Dr. Kaku applied that same concept to interstellar travel, the amount of energy needed to do that. Um, and he said that, well, special relativity uh, limits interstellar travel in a lot of ways. General relativity does not. And class two and cusp class three civilizations have uh, an ability to master space and time because of the amount of energies, energy that they can uh, control. Um, so that uh, what we might be seeing in terms of their technologies manifesting in our domain would not necessarily be recognizable to us as technologies. So there's a real problem for us in this UAP research field. On the one hand, we have to be objective. And on the other hand, everything in science tells us that we live in a populated universe. And nobody is looking for signs of extraterrestrial incursions. Um, other than groups like ours. So we're kind of tasked with the judgment <laughs> that what we're looking at is what it is and the responsibility to try and do something with that information in, a, in an environment that isn't really open to hearing us. And this has been a problem for NARCAP. We've had to, we, we've redefined the phenomena as UAP because it's more objective. A lot of phenomena, as you said, were little balls of light. This kind of stuff are not objects, so calling them UFO isn't really accurate. And then it allows us to spread it out because they could be coming from a variety of sources, natural as well as technical. And then on top of it, we're left as, as UAP researchers to sort of be the vanguard, you know, to know whether these in incursions are happening or not. Um, we suffer a real cultural blind spot around this. Uh, um, so, uh, doc Dr. Hawking uh, commented on how he thought that, you know, there was, there was enough uh, evidence around in, in the mathematics of, uh, of thinking about alien intelligences that we should be thinking about extraterrestrial or alien uh, planets and this sort of thing. And then he suggested that any of them that had mastered space tra travel were probably marauding nomads that would just come and raise the Earth to the ground for resources. Um, and then he said, I discount UFO reports because uh, they come from crackpots and weirdos. Uh, and I think you and I both know that that's not true. We have a dearth of, of military cases like the Minot B-52 case and stuff. He's really not qualified to be making comments like that. But, but what he's doing is he's demonstrating a cultural blind spot. It's a, it's a perceptual area where, on one hand, here you are looking right at the evidence that could, that could prove <laughs> that Fermi's paradox is only a paradox because if you ignore UFO reports, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's... it's, it's it's so enigmatic, you cannot get your hands around it because it has all these different little offshoots. It's not just a simple, oh, if it were only so simple, um, aircraft floating through the sky that had little occupants that wave at us every once in a while or perhaps come and steal us in the night and do God only knows what to us. But you have, when you do um, investigations sometimes, and I'm sure you have too, you run into these cases where this strange Paranormal stuff accompanies that. So now you don't just have uh, space occupants. Now you've got this other woo-woo stuff that is happening. People are reporting it, and it doesn't really fit in any one place. And it's just so hard to get your hands around. And then, of course, our, our tendency to anthropomorphize this. They must be little little people like us and having similar needs and characteristics and such. We just have no clue what is going on. And, and, I, and on top of that, I don't think academia uh, and uh, the, the powers that are really have any respect for this idea that we don't know what's going on. Everything, everything, if, if you adhere at all to the inflation theory, you know, inflation uh, theory, which holds that the universe was uh, had a fairly smooth expansion in its earliest moments, which allowed for the conditions for life from a very early time in the universe up to the present. I mean, if you accept that that's, that's a fact, and you have to consider that we live in a very populated place, and that if we're not detecting them, then either we're not trying hard enough, or we're ignoring them, or they're exploiting perceptual weaknesses. Um, and on top of that, look at our own science. We've got 600 years into what I'd call technical science. I mean, we've had science of some kind for a long time, but arising out of the Greek logics, you know, as a philosophy, it's, it's 
five, six hundred years old, I suppose. Um, and in that time, we learned how to fly, we learned how to defeat radar, we learned how to go into space, we learned what it takes to really go into space. Um, we, we acquired a lot of understandings about reality in general and in 600 years. And the one thing that we failed to do was imagine what it's been like for somebody who's been around for 10,000 years, 100,000 years, a million years, 10 million years. The likelihood that we're ever going to meet a culture our age is about zero. But the chances are we're going to meet one that's much older than we are. Uh, 10 million years is, 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 a, is a close gap in time, more like 50 or 100 or 500 million years. It depends on, on, on whether or not they're even from the habitability zone that Earth occupies. And, and another, another failure in imagination is to think, how would, uh, is it possible for any kind of culture, if you could imagine it, the right kind of culture, to exploit special relativity and colonize a habitability zone? And if the answer to that is yes, then all bets are off in terms of whether or not we're being visited or anything else. We need to be paying more attention. By the time we have a piece of an alien spaceship or a dead alien in our hands, we're going to have a lot more important questions to answer and a lot more important responses to gauge. And, uh, um, so I think that that just shoving this, this topic into the, the, the idea of uh, scientific empiricism being the only only evidence and the only proof and the only way to engage this is, 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 is a, could be a fatal mistake. Yeah, I, I rather think that the current scientific model is no longer helpful as we go forward. It is, um, in a way, it kind of holds science back. They can't think outside the box because the box has four corners in it and those four corners are the scientific method and if you can't measure and test and uh, use the scientific method to go forward on something then you can't go forward on some of the things that people are reporting you can't go there you can't get there from here using that approach well, th- think of it this way. I, I, I read a very interesting comparison about ufology the other day, and I wish I could give a proper uh, attribution to the person that said it. But she said that, that uh, ufology is much like meteorology. You, you're studying phenomena that you can't repeat, that you have to keep track of, and that, that, that you look for trends in over time. And then you're constantly trying to find theories and upgrade it. Um, it it's, it's, it's an approach that's a little different from the nuts and bolts, just, hey, I'm going to walk over there and dissect this vehicle until I know what it is. You know, um, everybody would like to see that approach, but I don't think it's obviously not possible. We're, we're talking about things that have trends. Um, Dr. Lee offered a, a six-layer approach to it all uh, to deal with this problem of incommensurability, this inability to prove things. And, uh, and, and also, um, Marcia, there's some trends in science that we need to look at. Um, the influence of entanglement theory on physics in general is is, is not to be underestimated. Um, there are some serious, serious reexaminations of how we perceive reality uh, as we consider entanglement and uh, non-locality. Yeah, the bilocation, uh, the bilocation of things kind of threw people for a loop. That's it certainly did. The... Yes, yeah, so again, it, it comes down to what you're looking at and whether it applies to that situation. Um, um, are you familiar with uh, Dean Radden? No. Um, He's a he. Last I heard, he was working for Institute of Noetic Sciences. Ah, uh, uh, yes, I'm a, familiar with that. Uh huh. He's been a, a, a their their ESP researcher for a number of years, and he's written some very compelling books. Um, one of it I, I just read the other day. It's from 2006. It's called Entangled Minds. And at the time, he was predicting that entanglement theory would 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 find a place in the discussion of of why certain paranormal things seem to be possible. ESP. But, you know, telepathy, this kind of stuff that uh, put off and tarred and those guys, Roush and others, established pretty well in the 60s and 70s. And the idea basically is that, you know, we're made up of all these materials and that, that our brains are, are very unusual objects in space-time, that we exist as objects in space-time, and that we have relationships to everything else in space-time, and that that space-time isn't separate from us, that we're not separate separate from the reality that we're in, that, that it's all one thing, that the human mind divides it up, and it's our divisions that make it hard to understand, but it is just one thing. That's it's one huge operating blob of activity. That's the universe, and uh, um, it's a singular thing. Nothing is really separate from anything else. That's the illusion of it all, and that, that um, the Buddhists, of course, have been telling us that for years, but um, I think we're going to find that, that these considerations are going to change and shape the way we look at physics and science, and they may 
develop exceptions and understandings about things that we didn't think were possible now that others may have learned to exploit. You know, you'd mentioned, I think, Dr. Jacques Vallée when you said Dr. Vallée. You, yes. You, yes. I have the impression that you're kind of in the ETH camp right now. Yes? Well, you know, I'm not really in a camp. I'm, I'm standing behind the data, and the data is provocative, and I'm not going to ignore that, and I'm not going to tell the world it isn't. Uh, I'm just not going to tell the world what I think it is. Uh-huh. Yeah, you should still, <laughs> you know. you, well, if you're like a lot of people, you're still formulating your idea of what it is. Now, I... I like Jacques Vallée's approach in that he came down to the point of um, he'll be disappointed if it's just aliens from outer space coming in and interacting because there are so many facets to this that he has, the last I heard anyway, kind of come to the feeling that um, there is an overriding type of operating system that is interacting with us somehow. And I almost sometimes get the feeling from reading and um, getting other people's ideas that uh, when you take into account physics and, and the world as it really is at the quantum level, you know, this is just, we're just quanta that is mushed into a shape and that's our corporeal portion. And then down into us is, is brought this kind of our mind, which is an operating system. And we're interacting in this really fascinatingly, intricate, digital, visual, virtual, virtual reality. reality. And what is intruding into our space that we're seeing is uh, these interruptions into this extraordinary video game that we're in thinking this is real. But nobody knows what this is. Nobody knows what's going on. We all have little portions of the animal that we're trying to corral and feel and touch and understand. But this animal has so many moving parts that, you know, I, I just want to say right out here, if anybody in men in black is listening, don't come to my house because I have no idea what this is. <laughs> I have no idea. Well, you know, and, and I, I, I can really respect that, Marcia, that the, 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 I think one of the primary traits of a good investigator is the ability to say, I don't know. And that's what I've been stuck with. I've had some remarkable experiences around unidentified aerial phenomena, including the, the provocative kind, and as well as the ones that might be explained more as natural phenomena, possibly. Um, and, uh, uh, and I don't know. I don't know. I can't really tell you anything other than what happened. And, the, uh, uh, and I don't know that all of these things are related to each other, whether they represent in Belize's words, the same operators, you know, if, if we don't have several different things going on, representing several types of, several approaches at dealing with our little world, you know, coming from different perspectives. I, uh, the, the, the key here, like you said, is not to anthropomorphize. You can't really know why or any of that. Um, but there seems to be consistency in the UAP profiles. And that, to me, that's something that we all can, that this is something we can latch on to identify the profiles. For example, we have pilot cases where the pilot gets on the horn and he says, hey, can you guys get this thing on radar? And the air traffic control back comes back and says, you know, we tried and we can't. So how many of those cases, what, what was the pilot looking at when they said that? And we'll throw that in a bucket with all the cases, with, uh, all the other descriptions of profiles that weren't detected. And we will know that when people see one or more of those particular type of profiles that, that we can expect they're probably not going to be detectable on radar. And we can use this as an attribute to understand part of those profiles. And we yes. continue teasing it apart and putting them together. And we're, we're going to see some very surprising things if we do that. If yeah. we work, we're going to get to a point where we can... This is what we did with Project Sphere. You know, uh -huh. What we learned was, out of the 120 aviation safety cases we had the, that involved... In, any of them that involved electromagnetic effects, concurrent failures on aviation systems, uh, involved balls of light. So now we've got something to kind of warn air controllers about, and we have a characteristic of that uh, profile of UAP. Um, and then we keep looking at subcategories of all these things and splitting them up until we've got, got them divided into families where we, we can more or less start looking at the mechanisms and give them a name. Yeah. And then they're not unidentified anymore. Yeah, that's the value you know? of having data. You, you have to that's have right. something you can look at and start to make sense of and put out there and, and put pieces together. Now it starts to form a little picture, maybe, kind of, you think, but the data that's is it. so important. 
And that's well, missing. It, it, that's it missing is, because so, people so aren't scoring your cases carefully is critical. Yes, but a lot of the data is missing because people aren't supplying the data. There are a lot of great minds that are not looking at this problem because, well, I don't know why. It's it's as if fairy dust has been sprinkled over their eyes and they just will not go there. But, you know, there's overwhelming evidence that something highly unusual is interacting with our environment and there isn't a hue and cry to find out what it is. In fact, there's almost the opposite. Well, there is the opposite, and it was embedded in our culture back in the time of the Robertson Plant Panel. Uh, it, it, it became a topic that was not acceptable in academia. Look at what John Mack went through. Oh, yeah. Uh, with with the, the Harvard Review Board. Uh, they tried to censor him. They failed. You know, Science... Science as, as a static is not very helpful, and that's what ufology is finding out. You can do science. There, there, you can collect the data and do the measurements and compile it all into a pile and, and, and so on. Um, but it's nothing unless there's a larger context. And that, that's the problem that you're talking about in terms of not being able to get any traction, not getting anybody to pay any attention to it, that this, this, this perceptual cultural blind spot. Um, because you there's no larger context. There's nobody saying we need to look out for, uh, along with meteor strikes and other things, we need to be paying attention to uh, the possibility of extraterrestrial incursions because they could be quite lethal, quite toxic to our, our culture and our, our survival, um, particularly if we can't understand them and divine what they're about quickly and respond to them quickly. And lo and behold, for the last 70 years, we've been getting nothing but hundreds and hundreds of reports of exactly that happening every year. And, it's not it's not delusion when it's coming from B fifty two crews and radar operators and 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 until there's a larger context, then we're still stuck with with the possibility of finding ourselves at a juncture sometime in the future, uh, realizing that we had all the clues we needed and we blew it. Yeah, you know that that kind of dovetails into the fabulous association that you uh, at NARCAP have put together with with the French. And the Chilean government research, uh, I think the French Air and Space Academy, you're doing actual scientific interaction with a real government agency in France and in Chile, right? Yeah. Now, yes. that's neat. And we, we, did, we did it with the GAO here in, in the U.S., too. Uh, um, and, and, yeah, it is neat. And this is, this is something that's really important. I'm, I'm very excited to share with your, your listeners is that... that um, uh, you know, for years I thought that we needed to be operating at the highest levels that we could be as an organization, and that's how I set my standards. That's why we're careful with our image. That's why you don't find us pontificating about aliens on all the podcasts, so that you won't see aliens on our website or pictures of anything other than what we actually think are actual photographs or, or a good explanation for them. And, and the result has been that, that our star sort of rose. We were able to differentiate ourselves enough from ufology and stay objective enough that uh, and, and bring enough really good minds to bear, like Dr. Blee and Dr. Haynes and, and Dr. Heisch and, and a lot of our staffers. And my, my skill, I guess, is administrating this thing and aiming it. found ourselves in sort of a rarefied atmosphere that when people are looking for, for experts, they come to us. And uh, I, I, I was just thrilled when the Chilean Air Force general started showing up in my emails in uh, um, 2010. We'd been taught, we'd been, we had a cordial relationship with that organization, CEFA-A, for pretty much since we started. But... Uh, and same, same thing with, with the French, too, with GPAN. But uh, they, they're starting to realize that, that if they want momentum on this and, and really want to do their jobs and, and get to the bottom of these studies, that they can't operate as candles in the dark. They have to come together. None of us have enough resources on our own to make this work, but we all have things we can contribute. Our aviation cases and investigations are very helpful to, to organizations that, that need a second opinion. CEFA sent us, uh, um, the Chilean group sent us a case that they were dealing with uh, they wanted another opinion. They actually wanted three opinions, and we were one of the other one of those three groups that, that studied their their case for them to give them an idea of what it was. They they, they wanted you know four different opinions so that they could decide whether it was conclusive or not. So participating in these things and being trusted to participate in these things is is very important. And I would urge anybody out there that is putting together a UAP research group to found it on conservatism and uh, be very careful with who you affiliate with. Well, now tell me your interaction with the the French Air and Space Academy and the Chilean uh, team, that CEFAA. Do you yeah. have the sense that 
um, as a whole, those organizations think these are intelligent incursions, not willy-nilly phenomenon just spontaneously flying about the skies. Um, I, I, I think that they, like us, think it's a mixture, uh, probably. If you were just going to pin them to the wall and say that, they, they, they would leave the, the subject open as far as the extraterrestrial hypothesis. And I don't really think E.T. is necessarily the right way to describe that hypothesis, I would say, a non-human intelligence hypothesis or something like that. And I, I, I think you, you can take a look at the uh, work of, uh, like, the Comata Report, which was an independent study that the French produced. Are, are you familiar right. with this? Right, yes, uh-huh. Well, uh, a lot of people involved with GPAN and in the peripheral of GPAN contributed to that document. And they all said they have cases that are very provocative and may be very important to humanity in general, should not be ignored. And uh, we say the same thing. And the Chileans say the same thing. Uh, there, there are things going on here. They're quacking like ducks. And the only people looking at it is us. And <laughs> somebody needs to pay attention to what it is we're seeing. And the, the thing is, is that, that we're not the only ones seeing it. These things trickle in through military channels, you know, when, a, when uh, there's a military encounter or, you know, um, civil aviation gets them from time to time. But, but somehow they lose their momentum in management or something before they ever get to a place where people with real decision-making power can make decisions. There's a, a quelching of, of all of this. And, and I can't help but think that at some level somebody knows a little bit more about this than we do, uh, but I'm going to proceed as if they don't. Well, there's, there is a real stigma um, surrounding that, that's for sure. Now, you know, that kind of makes me want to talk to you a bit, uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't, about the Chicago O'Hare Airport UFO um, experience that, that took place November seventh, two 2006. Now, here, here we are right at an airport. We've got FAA there. We've got... Um, radar, we have ground crew, we have air crew, we have people who apparently there were multiple witnesses to this oh, yes. craft over the runway. And apparently even year, two years later, some guy uh, anonymously, which kind of makes you suspect, but anonymously put on YouTube what he purported to be cell phone video of that. I looked and it's been pulled off YouTube. I don't know why, but uh, this is almost, you know, a perfect, perfect case for you guys. And yet it still defies explanation because those who could answer it will not. Well, that, that's part of it. Yes. Um, that, that just, just for your listeners, let's look, just do a quick recap. Um, Please do. on November 7th in the afternoon of 2006, there, uh, uh, a ramp controller from United, contacted the air traffic control um, hub there at um, O'Hare and said that, that there had been reports of uh, something hovering over sea terminal at uh, O'Hare that was shaped like a disc, and they, they guessed that it was maybe a 1,000 feet in the air. And uh, it was seen by ground crews and uh, um, other folks um, during this 20-minute or so stretch, but it wasn't seen by air controllers. The, the, the way the hub is designed, I think, probably blocked the view. Um, but this thing left, and it punched a hole in the clouds that left a tunnel in the clouds for some minutes afterwards. And uh, 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 we, we did an in-depth study of it. We studied radar. There wasn't much radar, um, no, no credible radar data. I, I handled the photography part of it, and there were no credible photographs or video offered of, of the phenomena. There was a few of them sent in, and I was able to pretty quickly disqualify them as... Uh, not what they were presented to be. And uh, uh, and then, so we're left basically with an incursion of, of uh, restricted Class B airspace um, in an area by, by a phenomenon that is unpredictable. Uh, and, uh, and according to some of our folks who were looking at it from behind the scenes, um, this thing was seen by pilots uh, who were in the air at the time as well as pilots who were on the ground. United pretty much told everybody to shut up about it, and uh, it's sort of understandable, but, but again, United is, is a, one of these cultures that isn't open to this, this whole subject for uh, image reasons, I think. So anyway, yeah, you, you end up with a case like this, um, and the problem is the lack of imagination to think that perhaps there are things out there that you can't detect on radar that you can see, and um, we fly them every day. They're part of our military and part of the defense of our country. Uh, we fly these things that are radar-invisible, 
based on the design of the cross section and the use of plasma to dull or blunt the the radar return. And uh, that plasma generator is on a lot of the new stealth aircraft. So there's kind of a lack of imagination. They'd rather sweep it under the rug and just look at something else because, again, it's like a meteorological event. And, you know, you had a type of weather that people don't, that rarely experience. They talk about it once in a while, that rarely ever experience when it happens. They just all kind of look at each other and shrug and say, oh, what are you going to do? So your your report, uh, you did not find any credible visual evidence? No, no, we didn't find any, any credible photographs or video. And there um, was nothing on radar? Uh, yeah, not, not, nothing conclusive on radar. Wow. Do you think it was and, something of ours? You know, I, I get that question, but then you say, why would we risk something with that incredible capability to, to take it out and hover it over a public airport and let everybody yeah. look at it? But yet it is known that, that we have um, we have technology, and you had mentioned, you know, an invisible-to-radar capabilities of, of cloaking some of our aircraft right now. So we know that there is stuff that we don't know about, right? Yeah. 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 Now, have you ever been waved off an investigation because, you know, you were kind of poking around in something of ours that was secret? You know, um, I've got team members who are who who have or have had classified uh, clearances, uh-huh. and uh, they're, they're all pretty sensitive to cases that might fit profiles of the um, classified projects. And uh, we make it a point to drop them like a hot potato whenever we think we might be in that area. Oh, really? Uh, and uh, yeah, we we really are not interested in 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 hurting our government. <laughs> you know, just imagine for a second, Marsha, Even if we're all what we're suspecting is going on here is actually happening. Uh-huh. There's there's more to the story. Um, why don't they want anybody talking about it? You know, if you look back at, at the explanations, it involves the idea of those a technically superior race basically absorbing and destroying a technically inferior race, and we see many examples of it in our history. And so the first thing they don't want is the, the technically inferior race to even know that there's a technically superior race. They don't want them talking about it. They don't want them thinking about it. They certainly don't want them seeing it or documenting it, and they don't want them. Uh, um, they don't want it to influence the, the civilization. So you do everything you can at, from the psyop point of view to make sure the civilization isn't influenced, including ridiculing anybody that might move that influence in that direction. I'm just speculating, but the the, the country, the whole subject of, of U, UFO research took a serious left turn between 1952 and 54, and the data. That, that the Patel Memorial Institute, their right. statisticians uh, dug out of there, is 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 quite provocative and and completely at odds with the Air Force claims. So, so, so in that sense, if there's there's more to the story here, and we want to be careful as researchers that we're not taking away the capabilities of our government by disclosing systems that we've come across. Uh-huh. Yeah, if we, if we were to. to go into a, a study and realize that we're looking at that something that probably belongs to the DOD or something, that we're not going to pursue it. Our work focuses on the safety issues around the uh, uh, the, the incidents where these things uh, come up around aircraft. Uh-huh. Um, in our papers, we say that, that, that a lot of these encounters have a, a, a quality of intelligence about them that is hard to articulate in writing, but, but is that seems to be rather clear to the witness. And... Uh, um, and we try to deal with it that way. I think we're all of the opinion that, that that if any of these profiles of UAP are actual, you know, uh, that the history of them goes back to World War II and beyond, which puts them out of our own capability pretty much right away. You can't really... I mean, when the best encryption machine we had was, was bolted to a, a sheet of three-quarter-inch plywood with giant wood screws and had copper wiring and, you know what I mean, and... Yeah. and adding machine parts in it and everything. Pretty Stone that Age. We, yeah, that's what we had for World War II, and defeating the Japanese codes and stuff. And, and if that, that's what we... Uh, our best airplanes, we didn't have jet fighters until the end of World War II, and these these historical profiles, the ones that go back a ways, um, are indicative of somebody that is able to do something that I don't think is our thing, you know. So NAR, NARCAP really is just um, very interested in nuts and bolts investigation and reporting, and uh, they're going to leave the speculation out of it. They're just saying this is what people are reporting. This is what our investigation and research is showing us, and here's the data, and make of it what you will. 
I think any intelligent person can sit and read, for example, our technical report 12 and realize that that, that little ball of light pulling up under the tail of the airliner raises a whole lot of questions. Uh-huh. And we don't have to raise those questions. We, we see it. We know it's there. The best thing we can do is make sure it's properly documented. And then at some point, we'll end up with a position statement, find ourselves locking arms with, with these other organizations. Uh, I think the Argentinians have a team that's coming on board now. Um, the and, and, and move forward, try and promote this information in a better way to the people that need to hear it. Um, I really think there should be something in, like, the UN ICAO or somewhere where uh, where there's an interest in these uh, low frequency of occurrence uh, safety events and also an interest in the idea that uh, the planet should be watchful for incursions by non-human intelligences. Uh, everything, everything in science to date tells us that we're not alone and that if we're not detecting them, that doesn't mean they're not coming here. Uh, well, your technical reports are pretty interesting I'm on the page, and we'll put that page up. And um, they, uh, they're very intensive. Uh, very well uh, written analyses and and investigations and stuff. I think our audience will enjoy perusing those. Now, what other kinds of things is NARCAP involved in studying right now? Well, we have several initiatives in the air at the moment. Um, uh, we're we're preparing a presentation for a closed um, workshop hosted by GPAN, the French team. So, Dr. Haynes and Dr. Bali will be presenting uh, papers there. In Paris, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, offering uh, uh, techniques in, in aviation investigations for the GPAN uh, investigator teams mm-hmm. to help them engage in aviation investigations. Perhaps a little more, a little better. Uh, they're pretty good, you know. The, the, the French don't. I mean, our, our compadres there are are quite capable in, uh, on their own. But uh, we're, we're sharing what we've experienced with this as well. And, and then Dr. Belize is going to talk about how to conduct. Um, a research arc away from where where we are right now, which is just collecting a lot of anecdotes, you know. And I think these projects like Project Sphere are really important. There should be a project disc and a project, you know, cylinder and a project, you know, whatever else, project lights, you know. And are you going to publish the outcome of that meeting? That sounds fascinating. Um, well, I, I might, but I think I'll leave it to the French because it is a closed meeting. Oh. And uh, uh, you can't even get into it without ID and passports and stuff, but uh, um, but to the extent that I can uh, share it, I will. If, if you go to our news page, I've got a, the program from the French team is, is on, on our news page. Uh-huh. Uh, it's on a clickable link at the top of the page there. It's, yeah, uh, NARCAP to present to Guy Pan's CNES workshop. Right, and it says the program for this meeting can be viewed here, and that, 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 that okay. can kind of show you what serious UAP research teams are thinking about and where we're at right now. So those, those organizations that are trying to, you know, to meet this standard uh, can understand what it takes to do it and how to calibrate their own investigations to help dovetail into this and become relevant. Antoine Cousin, for example, authentication of photos of unidentifieds, he's got a very, very interesting technology of work that um, really is good at, at breaking down digital photographs. Uh, and I, I saw some rather impressive examples of that. Um, and doc, Dr. Lee is offering unidentified aerial phenomena, a strategy for research. Um, I, I think also that the trend in this field is towards specialization. So those organizations that can that, that aren't shotgunning, uh, like MUFON and stuff, that, that are more like our organization that are picking a very narrow pie slice to go after, mm-hmm. they may have a lot to contribute in the end. I, I think we're coming to a point where we've gotten all, about all we can get out of collecting anecdotes, uh, and we should keep doing it. And uh, and collecting evidence as we can, but we really need to start working the data as we have it. And, and it'll, it'll put us somewhere where we can start asking some questions and maybe develop some ideas. Yeah. Um, Massimo Chiodorani has some very mature concepts, too, about what, what's going on and, and how to go about engaging it. Another one is Milan Cherkovic. And then, and then I, I think the idea is to, to understand that if it, science doesn't really need to, I mean, we don't need to prove anything to a scientific certainty. What we need to do is be vigilant and make sure that we're documenting carefully and that somebody cares about what we're documenting. A trusted investigative body is certainly um, very, very important. You know, there's an awful lot of, of amateurs who are doing their own kind of investigations, and uh, thank God for them. There, there's high-speed photography. People are catching things with very good lenses, very good high-speed photography that um, 
I find pretty provocative. But then, too, one of the biggest banes in this business is all these hoaxers and frauds and trying to wade through what is genuine and what is fraud is just wearing people down. Well, you can, this, this study will make a snake out of you if, you if you aren't careful. You know, cultivate, I don't know. And uh, like the samurai, you know, expect nothing, be ready for anything. Yeah, I'm cultivating, I don't know, real good. The more I look into this, the more I do not know. So, yeah, that's pretty much my mantra at this point, And I'm pretty comfortable with that. It used to be I kind of thought I knew. But the more I know, the more I realize I don't know. And I'm pretty comfortable with not knowing anything. You know, well, we're just going to have to just keep pushing. We're challenged by, by physics and how to think about it. We get frustrated with science because we don't understand science. It's not science's fault. There's a larger context that has failed to materialize. I mean, when you, when you look at a court case, that's the larger context. You use science to prove the facts or the issues inside the court case, and that will allow you to make a good judgment about the larger picture. But science by itself is nothing. You have to have a larger context. And, and until we get people paying attention to this and really getting it, that we, we do need to, be, that it, some of these cases are very provocative and indicative of things that, that, that we should be concerned about. Yeah, it's, it's science. It's magic to us, but it's science. And we just need to bring new tools to bear to uncover exactly what this science is. That is yes. a big job. Well, you know, consider consider this too. Um, you know, on one hand, you know, we're trying to get evidence of all of this stuff and to satisfy an, an empirical view. But on the other hand, just think: you got a civilization that that's been a civilization for ten million years. Humans have been humans, arguably for two to four hundred thousand years. I think the Awash Valley, the oldest modern human fossils, were one hundred eighty thousand years, something like that. So, so you've got a, a civilization that's been a civilization for 10 million years. They've literally watched their, their physical form change over time as a culture, not as a disparate band of hunter-gatherers, as, as a culture. And they've cultivated space travel, and they've cultivated science to the point where, given that, that we can lose an airliner or two every couple of years and not predict meteors hitting Russia, and this sort of thing. We don't have radar coverage of our planet, really. It's, it's primary radar coverage is very limited. And uh, if this intelligence was able to breach a uh, military sensing platform's radar and whatever else we have, if they were able to breach that, they can roam the planet with impunity. They simply can. And all you got to do is sit with any, any Air Force general or anybody that's in charge of that and ask, can you imagine a scenario whereby his, his um, sensing platforms could be defeated? And uh, the answer is yes. And with that comes all bets are off in terms of what's actually happening. And so that's why officially they don't go there, right? Right. I mean, I, I would not want to stand there and tell the world that I can't defend the planet. Uh, but that's exactly the case. They can't. Hmm. They never could. They haven't got there yet. And, uh, uh, I saw the, 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 new HF, uh, the new THL laser systems that they put together. They're, they're going to have them distributed by 2020, I think. They can, they can lock in and, and put a destructive beam on a missile in a, in a second, one second. And they, they, they have a turret, and they can mount them on a battleship or that kind of stuff, use them. But they only have a five- or six-mile range, and they're only going to get a, get a few dozen of these things out deployed by 2020. So we, we've got nothing. You know what I mean? We've yeah, got nothing yeah. in terms of protecting our planet. Yeah, yeah, we really are standing there naked with a little fig leaf on. We're very primitive, I suspect, very primitive, and suffering under a multitude of illusions, and quite happy right. to. That's a, that's, a fair, that's a fair description. We're hardwired to be what we are, and that comes with perceptual blind spots. And in any, uh, any, we, do, we do it when we study animals. We exploit their perceptual blind spots to get close to them, whether we're going to hurt them or whether we're studying them or whatever, taking pictures of them. It doesn't take much to consider that, that we have limitations, too, and that anything that learns how to skirt around the edges of that is, is going to be able to enjoy being in close proximity while we argue about it. <laughs> well, let's, <laughs> let's um, bring it to an end here. We have sure, no discussed problem. a range of things here, and um, I certainly appreciate okay. your time. Okay. Sure, I appreciate that. And um, if you see a collaboration in the future or some direction or ideas that you have that you want to discuss more, let me know. Okay.
Next up, a case discussion we held recently. This meeting was the first by our newest API team member, Joseph Conway. Joe will tell the audience a little bit about himself. Basically, I started at about 18 years old in the space program. Uh, worked for General Electric Missile and Space. I've actually built some hand built some components that are sitting on Mars today, and I've left the solar system. I have also uh, spent some time on the Apollo project. I actually helped build the transmitter that was out in the aircraft carrier. So though that was early years, and then I went on to become a senior design engineer with Sperry Univac for computer systems, and then took that on into director of international marketing for the semiconductor industry for companies like Advanced Micro Devices and Stanford Telecom, people like that. Then I retired about 14 years ago. For the last 10 to 12 years, I, for yucks and giggles and for a lot of fun, I build and fly uh, large rockets and uh, actually do my own motor design, my own motor construction and rocket construction. And I've been so, involved with flying not my own, not only my own stuff, but uh, both liquid fueled, liquid oxygen alcohol and liquid oxygen and kerosene rockets. What made me decide to talk to you folks and maybe get involved is, uh, well, actually I'll just kind of read verbatim since I routinely fly supersonic rockets to very high altitudes and also grew up with light aircraft, I'm reasonably good at judging altitudes and speeds. This occurred while sailing late one very clear night on Clear Lake, which is a very large lake in Northern California. My son has a sailboat on the lake and we often sail into the wee hours then anchor out spending the night on the boat. This occurred during the early summertime about two years ago. Unfortunately, I don't remember the exact dates or time, uh, exact time anymore either. I was sailing the boat looking out to the west at about 11.45 p.m. and I noticed a very bright orange light hovering in the sky that then changed to a bright white light and then back to orange again at about 15 second intervals. As soon as I decided it was truly odd, I brought my son's attention to it. This object was at an altitude of about 15,000 feet, about five miles away, or actually so it appeared. After about three minutes of being stationary, it quickly moved across the sky to a more northern position, still about four miles away. This occurred with an instantaneous burst of speed that I would estimate at at least 1,200 miles an hour. It hovered again for a while, then moved back and forth a distance of about one mile at the same instantaneous speeds. This went on for about five more minutes, then it swiftly vanished for about a minute, then showing up in the eastern sky at least 15 miles away, still at about 15,000 feet. About five minutes later, it again vanished, never to be seen again. This thing never made a sound, nothing, not even a sonic boom. Unfortunately, it was pitch dark and its lights were extremely bright, so I was unable to see either its shape or est estimate its size. My son and I spent the next couple of hours trying to tie it to any aircraft, copter, or anything else we could even think of and had absolutely no success. So dealing with that and being scientifically oriented, I decided to see if I could get involved to do some firsthand uh, investigation and analysis of what other people see. So that's what caused it all to happen. Now, having witnessed that and having been in the uh, business of rocketry and science and, and um, engineering, you came to the conclusion, did you, that that was probably not something of earthly origin? Uh, won't go that far. It was something I couldn't make any sense out of. But again, also here in the recent past out at Friends of Amateur Rocketry, I was sitting there one night with another gentleman and we watched an orange flame-like object with an orange flame coming out of it across the entire sky and disappeared in the west at about nine o'clock in the evening. The doggone thing came back across about an hour later and, uh, we were close to Edwards, and it just could have simply, simply been a military aircraft, that one. But uh, the other one I never did make any sense out of, but you know, boy, I would have liked to have known a lot more about it. Anyway, that's what prompted me to get involved. Well, you know, that is kind of common. You get all kinds of walks of life, whether you're Joe Schmo working at the gas station or you can be a top engineer, top scientists, people see things that they just can't explain. I, you know, I zoom into the fact that Joe just doesn't know what it was. He didn't, he didn't jump to the conclusion that it was not of this world. 
And that's the kind of witnesses we need because they provide the, what they saw. They don't speculate. They don't, they don't exaggerate the claims, et cetera, like that. Um, it's unfortunate that, and Marsha, you've seen this in the last couple of years, that that's all you're going to get. It's an amazing report. You know, we don't, you're not going to get, you know, someone coming up, at least not that I'm aware of, but nobody's going to come up to your garage and saying, here's the flying saucer, you know, uh, and trailing it in their pickup truck. I said this a million times. This is about investigating something that already happened. It's 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 kind of like a, a a police case. The the crime already happened. We're the detective to try to piece as much as we can of the event. It's not real science. It's not like you know we can all go back to that same spot to where Joe saw that event and expect to see the event happen again. That's very very seldom in ufology. There aren't that many credible, and I emphasize credible cases where people go back a second, third, fourth time and, and see the same event again. What I look at as an investigator, you know, is for somebody like, like Joe to, to report that, hey, this is a reoccurring event. And as scientists, that's what we're looking for is, is uh, to collect enough data to come up with some type of hypothesis. We can't do much other than, okay, he saw something weird. I believe him, he's credible, case closed, unidentified. That's where we need to put our energy. Um, I told you guys years ago, the majority of the cases are, are, are one, sh you know, they're one shot, you know, and even half of those cases, the, the witnesses don't even want to respond. Very seldom. You're not going to see many of these cases like, like Rob has. I've, if you look back at, at the last three years, two cases, maybe three, where we mm -hmm. had an ongoing event out of 500 cases we looked at maybe. We don't want to chase cases, but we got this case with Rob that is an ongoing phenomenon. Can you speak to that, Rob? Um, the guy lives in New York, and um, he's recording um, from his apartment. Uh, I believe it's his apartment room, um, and he's essentially he's setting up a video camera um, on his in his window, and he just sets record and he leaves it, and then he goes back and checks it after several hours. Um, and that, that's basically what he's doing. And he's been seeing objects, I believe, since 2012 is when he first saw his, uh, or first captured his first object. And it appears that um, over the last four or five months that the frequency has gone way up. He's relatively um, camera literate, so he's taking uh, high quality images, images the, the odd thing is the diversity of the objects. Um, and what I mean by that is he's seeing a, uh, a triangle, uh, balls, uh, spheres, classical discs. So he's seeing everything, right? And he's recording everything. Most of it appears to be trash bags and things of that nature. I've seen some of the videos. Uh, this guy reminds me of the case we had in Baltimore. I think it was last summer, if you guys recall. Um, and even the other guy in Washington, D.C., where you and I, Marsha, went to talk to. So he'll set up all these cameras and all these high-speed things. And we'll get just about anything from flies to mosquitoes to, you know, all kinds of weird objects. And he interprets them to what he you know, other than natural or physical phenomena, you know, it's, it's extraterrestrials. Uh, and I looked at some of the videos he's, he, cause he's sending them to me and CC me and stuff like that. And I'm looking, I'm like, that looks like a, you know, just by the shape and the size and the speed, it looks like a bug flying by or a piece of debris or the shadow of a bird or something. And, you know, I, I, I don't see something that says, Oh my God, that's a flying saucer. That That's what it's going to come down to, you know? Yeah. This is where the investigation becomes valuable because Rob yeah. has set up a, an approach to this investigation that I think he's talked to the witness about. You want to, you know, speak to that, Rob? Sure. I mean, I, I have made clear to him that I'm not, I can't make leaps of faith. That's not my role here. My role is to just analyze the data. Um, but first, I have to have this set in an organized way and it has to be cataloged because right now he's still, I'm, he's getting better, but he's just sending me random stuff yeah. and it's, it's overwhelming. So I'm just trying to get him to yeah. um, send it to me in, in a focused, more focused way, in an organized way. What is the date? 
What's a name for the file so that I can systematically go through this stuff rather than just saying, hey, look at this cool clip. Boom. That doesn't do much for for analytics. When I get these types of cases, what I like to do is is, is kind of wrap it into and this is where a little psychology comes in is like, hey, this is good stuff, but I'm not really seeing what you're seeing or what you're trying to tell me you're seeing. However, if you see this kind of stuff, get in touch with me. And I tell, I'll tell them, look, we're looking for like uh, something metallic, something that where I can pause the video, I see something. I see a shape. I see a color. I don't see something fuzzy. I don't see something transparent. And when you work it and shape your 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 dialogue with the guy that way, the massive emails kind of stop. Then when the guy finally sees something that, oh, this is what Rob was asking for, okay, now let me shoot at him. So then you might get better videos and better photos and stuff like that. That's the tone I take with a lot of these witnesses. They're, 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 it's that's you know they they're being friendly. They love this kind of stuff. Some people are really into this 24 hours a day. Uh, and that's the message you got to put out is like, hey, cool stuff, but this is what I'm looking for. Can you help me with that? Rob and I were talking about having two cameras. If, if we could put a camera in the same part of the sky shooting simultaneous and see if both those cameras capture something. And then Rob was saying they could triangulate maybe something and get an idea of distance and size. And, and that would give us a little bit more, too, to hang a hat on. This is New York City. It's, if there's a large object in the area, you can always go to MUFON and you see 15 and 20 people report it, you know, the same report in the same night. So that's what yeah. you gotta be looking for too. You know, if he's saying, oh my God, look at this black triangle and nobody else is reporting it, that's something you might wanna look into. Some well, of the, the red... things he's reporting are very, very fast objects. Yeah. 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 Well, the, the red flag for me with this guy is, um, he's very adamant about not sending me the raw images. And what I, what I can't understand is why he can't just send me a disc of the videos and the images. And he wants someone to come up there and watch it on his screen with him. As yeah, a, that won't work. He's got to supply the real deal video. Otherwise, you know, we'd have to cut him loose because he just might want a friend. It does sound a little bit like that. But on the other hand, there's there's one or two images that really do make me look twice out of the 10 or so that I've gotten. And one of them is the image of the uh, and it is it looks like a, a Jetson futuristic type uh, small plane uh, around the New World Trade Center. Yeah, um, I, saw, and, I saw that one, too. That was interesting. That was an interesting photo, right? I'd like to I'd like to look into that kind of stuff more than the furry, uh, fuzzy black object zipping across my screen. And so I've tried to say to him, that's that's what I'm kind of after. Like maybe I should make that more clear. Yeah, this he needs is to what be I really want. Really directive. Be very directive okay. on that because he wants to he wants to assist in an investigation. And to right. do that, then he has to do one, two, three, or A, B, C. And one of those is to get you the real deal footage and then um, just hold off until you have a chance to give a look at that. So I think if you're really directive with him, then I think he'll get it and you might get more cooperation. And if you oh. don't, then Rob, that's led you down the path that will allow you to say, well, this, this isn't something we can investigate. Okay. Yeah. Just a quick question. Is there anybody from API in the New York area that could just go over there? Um, we got Ray yeah. Nuvalone up in, uh, northern New Jersey, he's pretty close. Um, Jersey, but if you can get one. enough to go on, it might be worthwhile, otherwise not. Yeah, you know, usually I go to New York three or four times a year. I'm, I'm actually making a trip here real soon, so if this guy's still active, I'm, he's in Brooklyn, you said? I could probably see yeah, what he's he had and stuff like that. But still looking at it doesn't tell you anything. Going there to his house and turning on his television and sitting down and having chips and beer and looking at his <laughs> footage is not going to get the job done. Right. He's got to relinquish the footage. It has to be in our hands. We have to examine it. Well, the last email I got from him said that he was going to try and transfer it to a Blu-ray for me. One assessment was that he, uh, there was a picture of a jet and it looked like it was descending. And then three or four seconds later, there were these two spheres that come floating by. Well, to me, it was just blatantly obvious that these were two balloons stuck together. 
I, and I mentioned that to him. I was like, the logical thing for me is that these are just two balloons caught in a current. Some, and he just, he just lost it. He was like, oh, my, you know, there's no way these are balloons. They couldn't stay together. They couldn't go to that altitude and, you know, all of these things. And he was dead set on them not being balloons. And so the open-mindedness factor went, went way out the window there. So When a witness is so invested emotionally that they can't be objective with what they're, what they're seeing. And I know Antonio's had a lot of those cases, and I, I have too. And you've got clear cases of pareidolia, and the person just cannot go there with you. It's, it's clearly God they're looking at, and no, it's just a cloud. Right. So those are hard to manage. You've got to kind of cut those loose. I'd rather spend my time on, on on genuine witness who just saw a light in the sky and really wants to be part of the investigation than someone who's who's just don't want to cooperate and gives us all these excuses about they can't do this, they can't send that. You got to do what Marsha does. I need this in seven days, case closed. In my acknowledgement email now, I'm going to make more clear what is expected of them as a witness. And if they want to go forward, then we will. But they have to meet these parameters. Right there at the very beginning, they're going to understand what is expected of them as a witness. If they want to have this investigated, then this is what they're going to have to do. And Because we're kind of chasing our tails. You know, we've got stories till the cows come home. But there's no reason to investigate a story. What are we going to do with that? We toss it in our database. And then, you know, at some point in time, maybe somebody can file through there and make some sense of it. But like Antonio says, a story is just a story. What, what good's a story going to do an investigator? Unless, you know, we get another story similar to Joe's, you yeah. know, story. And then we go, oh, wait a minute, Joe, somebody saw the same thing you saw on a boat too, same day, yeah. same time. Now we might have something. We've got two. Yeah, corroboration on something matters. Yeah. Uh, but that's why we yeah. retain, no matter how ludicrous the story is or how lukewarm and boring they are, we always keep them, you know, we know investigate them, but we keep them for reference. Yeah. Now, I would like to point out something, that there's some work going on in California, and somebody we're loosely associated with is uh, involved in this, which is to try to capture photos of UFOs in an instrumented way. What he wants to do is is set up cameras where he can capture, uh, he, he can actually accurately determine distance, size, uh, shape, velocity from instru- you know well instrumented robotic cameras. Uh, and if he and if he catches something, well, you, you think you'd want to have boots on the ground pretty quickly, right at right thereafter. Well, hey, where he's at is about two hours away from me, uh, looking west off the Santa Monica Mountains, but I'm not sure. I guess that would be convenient if you're in Hollywood. Well, that it is, yeah. It's not far away. Yeah. Well, it's near Pacific Palisades, right? You could just... Well, there's supposed to be theoretically a UFO hotspot if you watch the TV programs. Hmm. There was a rocket-type object that left the uh, ocean between uh, L.A. and uh, Catalina about in 2010. And that made a pretty good flap around the rocket community, actually. So I guess they have a reason to look out that way. They have specific test ranges, you know, like... Edwards and and Vandenberg. So, uh, yeah, if it just pops out of the ocean, that's unexpected. Well, it was actually on TV. I actually saw it again about uh, two weeks ago, running on one of those things. And to me, it looked just like the doggone rocket I'm going to launch this Saturday. Huh. And including its white smoke trail. So, hmm. Well, I just thought it was interesting because the first thing I said is that's it's some crazy out there with a barge launching a rocket. You know, speaking about some some amateur rocket guy sitting out there on a barge at night lighting up rockets and and having a good time. I'm thinking also these people who are buying all these little gyroscopes that are. Oh, you mean the quadcopters? Drones, little kit drones, you know, that they're putting lights on and flying up and and everybody's thinking they're seeing a flying saucer now. Yeah, the quadcopters are a problem because they're they're pretty quiet and they're very they're very stable and they're very maneuverable. Uh, yeah, and if you cut if you cut their lights like that, guess what? A UFO just disappeared in front of your very eyes. Yeah, we've got real problems with not just hoaxers, but people who aren't trying to hoax that are that are launching their own little rockets that are sending up balloons that you can buy amateur balloonists that look like flying saucers. 
they're you know they're manufactured to look like a flying saucer so you've got that they aren't trying to hoax but people are going to see it and they're going to think automatically they've seen a ufo and then you've got people with these little gyroscopes and and the baby drones and then you know even people who still have those little um helicopters that are flying remotely at night you can you can do a lot with that so uh, and then there was this guy who was was flying his um ultralight at night and it was videoed by somebody with a night scope and he thought he saw a high flying triangular ufo but you know it wasn't it was some ultralight so there's an awful lot up there that can be misconstrued to be something other than what it is and we are confronted with that all the time and everybody who's doing um investigations certainly is too so there's just a cornucopia of fake hoax and misidentified stuff out there to wade through it's really almost too much well well you have to watch out for things that look like leds uh flying around uh they're they're and they're not doing anything impossible they're just flying around and, and not making noise that's probably somebody's quadcopter and yeah you can get them pretty cheap i've seen demos of ones that are that are hand size and others that that are more um, maybe uh, 30, 40 centimeters across. And uh, I was at the, I went to the Washington Science and Engineering uh, celebration that they have every year in DC, which is this huge thing in the in the convention center. And there were a couple of quadcopter demos, and and I was impressed at how quiet they were, and how how they could hover so stably, just like. The control is really, really stable and, and solid. So, you know, it can fly right up to a point, stop quickly, and hover. This is API Case Files. Case files. You're listening to API Case Files, the official podcast of the Aerial Phenomena Investigations Team. Check out our website at www.aerial-phenomenon.org. Remember, you can report a UFO sighting on the form found at our website. You can just make a report or, if you wish, request an investigation. But be advised, to investigate, we'll need your ongoing cooperation. That means, typically, we will have to contact you and conduct an interview to gather enough pertinent data on which to base a valid investigation. If you're not comfortable with this, then at least put as much info as you can surrounding your sighting on the report form when you submit it. This info will go directly into our database. Include the estimated size of the object you saw, the estimated distance it was from you, the estimated altitude, what direction the object was traveling, any unusual movements, color, shape of the object, sounds if any, lights if any. All this information is important and should be included as best you can determine. And of course... All personal information you provide is kept strictly confidential. And now, here's our Deputy Director Paul Carr with his latest installment of Unidentified Science. I spend a fair bit of time trying to think of a clever metaphor for skepticism and failed. So for now, let me just remind you that I've been saying for some time that skepticism is a virtue and a practice that we must not only accept but embrace. Before we do that, though, let me remind you briefly about what skepticism isn't. Skepticism isn't 
about arguing that one static view of the world is superior to its rivals. It isn't cynicism, an attitude of superiority, or membership in the elite tribe of reason and science. Nor is it a commitment to discredit any controversial claim. Skepticism doesn't make you better than other people, but properly practiced, it can help you be better than you were or might have been without it. Some of you, most I expect, will have painful memories of fundamentalist debunkers calling themselves skeptics who will take refuge in any half-baked, hand-waving explanation in a storm so long as it does no violence to their worldview. I promise that we're not talking about this skepticism in name only, which is actually just a strident defense of dogma. It's easy to claim the critical thinking high ground when no one else challenges you for it, but that is what we are going to do. I'm on the side of discarding the dishonest and the mistaken, and I make so bold as to think that's what you want as well. To paraphrase the late lamented Richard Feynman, Skepticism is really just about honesty, about not fooling people, and crucially recognizing the painful truth that you are the easiest one to fool. I have mentioned before the book by Aronson and Tavris, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, which brings this home with example after infuriating example in medical science and criminal justice and psychotherapy and war and peace and personal relationships and more. We find that we humans not only are willing to deceive ourselves, but go about it with great energy and invention. Of course, the byproduct of this self-deception is that we also fool others. What hope is there for us, then? How do we get anything right? Tangled mess of biases, blind spots, fictional memories, and self-justifying narratives that we all are. Well, it isn't easy, but we finally seem to have invented the one thing that usually works over the long run, and there isn't a close second. It's a way we have of helping each other through all our human failings called science. And here is something that the general public, the media, and even some scientists usually completely miss. Science can only thrive when doubt is valued and uncertainty is honored. This attitude of skepticism, demanding that for any idea to be even provisionally accepted, we must do everything we can think of to show that it is wrong, is essential not only to science, but to self-defense in a world full of fraud and irrational fervor. When it comes to our hopes for a UAP science, A skeptical attitude is absolutely essential, not just to making progress, but to survival. With the data so ambiguous and open to interpretation, it is far too easy to fall into the trap of confirmation bias in which believing is seeing. There are too many rabbit holes to fall into, and they are deep and hard to escape. Many never escape their particular warren. I have seen it, and it is just sad. Skepticism brings doubt to the forefront. As skeptical investigators, we never stop asking ourselves if the data are authentic and if there are other ways to interpret the data. We constantly wonder if we might be fooling ourselves. You won't last long as a serious field investigator if you're not skeptical. However, we also head into a new case with curiosity and respect for the witnesses. We are not pedantic naysayers come to rescue people from their unreason, a hopeless mission in any case, but are earnestly open to whatever we can learn. We want to know what facts can be established and what testimony can be corroborated. We always keep the null hypothesis in the mix until multiple lines of evidence clearly retire it. In many cases, the witness is an honest person who just misinterpreted something. In a few cases, our investigation shows that the claims of the witness are simply bunk, and then we debunk. In a small residual of cases, we can't explain the report. 
We then have to say those three little words that mean so much. I don't know. When you can go through that whole process, end to end, with reason and integrity, and still say, I don't know, then you are a proper skeptic. Be proud. In the next Unidentified Science, I'm going to get into an important tool we use called the Probability Strangeness Matrix. I will discuss objective criteria for placing a case on this matrix and how we might use that information to better understand the underlying phenomenon. Next up, we hear from API's founder and director, Antonio Paris, with Investigator's Notebook. Today we're going to talk about one important part of the report investigation, otherwise known as the ROI, and that is the case synopsis. As a former special agent for the DOD, I have written and read hundreds of ROIs. But for the most part, they all have one thing in common, and that is the first page. On the first page is the case synopsis, and that's exactly what it is. It is a summary of all the details regarding the case. This includes information about the witness, information about the case background, the investigator's techniques and procedures, and more importantly, the conclusion of the case. So, in short, rather than reading the entire report investigation, most of us just want to read the case synopsis. This is API Case Files. Case Files. Antonio Paris again from API with our 22nd recommendation. For my recommendation, I highly suggest the website Weather Underground. We often want to know what was the weather like when a UFO was reported. And in this case, we can use Weather Underground to find the historical weather during that date. By knowing the exact location, date, and time of a particular UFO case, you can go to Weather Underground and find the exact weather for that time. My recommendation would be to study cloud formations. Knowing the different types of clouds helps give you an idea of the height of a cloud. And if you know the approximate height of a cloud, you can sometimes extrapolate the height of an object seen in a particular cloud. I'd like to recommend a simple but really useful smartphone app, Clinometer. Clinometer lets you easily measure the elevation angle of any object using your smartphone, a capability essential for field investigation. Clinometer is available for both Android and iOS. That does it for API Case Files, Episode 5. Your hosts have been Antonio Paris, API's founder and director, and me, Marsha Barnhart, API's chief of investigations. We wish to thank our special guest, Ted Rowe of NARCAP, for his appearance on our show. We're glad you could join us today. Please recommend our podcast to your friends and acquaintances. Links in the show notes for this episode can be found at apicasefiles.libsyn.com. 
If you want to drop us a line, that would be great. We can read your letters on the show. We always appreciate your input and ideas on content. Episode 6 of API Case Files should be out in October, with more case discussions, more interviews, and hopefully some interesting input from you, our listeners. All music heard on this podcast is licensed under Creative Commons. This free use with attribution music is deeply appreciated, and we thank the musicians and songwriters for sharing their creative spirit. This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. Episode 5 was produced by Marsha Barnhart with help from Antonio Paris and Paul Carr. The spoken content of API Case Files is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license. This is API Case Files.